All right, Creatures of the Night, we are here with our go-home show for World's End, and it's not, it wasn't that great. Now, I did do a live stream. If you checked it out, thank you for supporting and, um, you know, sticking around with me um, throughout this lame-ass show. Okay, it wasn't lame-lame, but there was a lot of lame things about this where it's just like, oh, Tony Khan, what are we doing? Um, before I get into the review, really the main problem here is that um, some decisions here tonight just was, I don't know, just kind of seemed like there was no thought put into it. Um, we also have um, the pay-per-views on Saturday, and from what it looks like, there's no collision. So with there not being any collision this week, they put a lot of shit in this episode where it was just like, here, we're throwing this at you, we're going to throw this at you, we're going to put that, we're going to put that. And it's just like, whoa, let me get a chance to breathe. If I wanted to be taking in this much information and frustrated about it, I'd be clocked in at work right now. Now, Tony Khan, he does this almost every pay-per-view where it's just these last second bookings. So many matches were just announced tonight and the pay-per-view is on uh, Saturday. And it's just like, how do you keep expecting to, for people to want to buy these things when you're putting things together last second? I just did not necessarily enjoy some of these matches that were just thrown into this pay-per-view. I, I, I don't know. Tony Khan right now is getting his ass lit up on X right now. Everybody is just talking about his poor decisions in terms of booking, especially when it comes with um, the pay-per-view. Just to show in general, the Continental Classic, that's another thing, how we, who we ended up getting in the finals. And also, with the whole Mass Devil fiasco foolishness that happened tonight, yes, I'm going to get all into that. Now, our first match was a triple threat match. Um, for the Gold League, we had John Moxley versus Swerve Strickland versus Jay White. And it's kind of funny because I kind of felt like Jay White was like being treated by Moxley and Swerve like this redheaded stepchild is not supposed to be here. Let's just try to get him out of our way and we just do what we do. And um, it, it seemed to be something that kept reoccurring. And when it when they had that little theme going on in this match, I kept feeling like it would have been a real swerve if uh, Jay White would have ended up winning this. So I kind of kept thinking in the back of my head, like, what if Jay wins? That would have been absolutely insane. However, John Moxley ends up pinning um, Jay White for the win. Now, this was a really great match, and I did enjoy the chemistry here, but. I've said it since the very beginning that John Moxley was going to be one of the ones in the finals at the pay-per-view, and I was right about that. However, as much as I love Moxley, when it actually happened, I'm kind of feeling some type of way where it's just like, damn, you know, I, I said this would happen, but I don't feel good about it because now I'm looking at Swerve and JY, two young men that are hungry in this business, that are having really great matches. They've done really well for themselves this year. And there's a there's a tournament that could really help um, put a, a stamp on their career and take them further. And instead, we get John Moxley, who's three times AEW champion, um, who's part of BCC, who's been there, done that throughout his whole career, who's had success in WWE, who's had success in the Indies, and and here he is getting another opportunity to something big while these young cats are putting on really great matches. But it's like, well, y'all not getting no big opportunities. Something like that just did not sit well with me. But congrats to Moxley for making it all the way. Uh, well, almost all the way. Now we do have Swerve who's backstage with Prince Nana and Tony Giovanni. He's absolutely not happy about not advancing into the tournament. However, he does take Keith Lee's little challenge and say, look here, bitch, I'll go against you at World's End since I ain't doing anything since I lost the damn tournament. And then all of a sudden, Tony Giovanni already got a contract where it's, you know, uh, you know, all thing out for the pay-per-view. And Prince Nana's like, wait a minute, I'm Swerve's uh, manager. I ain't seen this document. Where the fuck was this document at for me to look at for my client? And honestly, I agree. So already, they already made up the decision to already have Swerve and Keith Lee. In my opinion, Swerve has done amazing things this year. And he's at that point in his career where it seems like it, it can only go up from here. And no shade to Keith Lee, but it just seems like y'all revisiting something that happened way earlier in the year 
They tried to revisit this again when Keith Lee came back and for whatever reason didn't work out. And then now here we are when Swerve is really at a level in his career where we just gotta keep pushing him forward. Now you're kind of taking him back to go with Keith Lee. And for me, it's not sitting well with me, but we'll see what they do between these two guys. Either way, um, congratulations to Swerve for having a really great year and I can only see it getting better from him and also for Jay White. So now we have Mariah May who comes out and she's letting us know that her debut match will be next week Dynamite because she's still over 2023. So okay, we'll see you next week Mariah. Now um, Riho comes out, chases her ass, but then Tony comes out with the women's title to attack Riho. Um, that doesn't end up happening. Luther ends up catching uh, Tony and then that's pretty much it. Nothing special to go on here. I just wish things were just a little bit more entertaining. In my opinion, I've said this before, I do think Mariah May's first match will be against Tony Storm, and I think that would be interesting. Now after this, we do have Top Flight who says they lost their opportunity to Trio's Gold. However, they're issuing a challenge. And then once again, your homeboy, Orange Cassidy, comes out of the blue and he says, all right, cool, we'll fight you. So it's going to be Top Flight, Action Andretti versus Orange Cassidy, Rocky Romero, and our boy, Trent Beretta. Now after this, we do have Miro who wants to fight Andrade El Idolo. And like he said, he wanted to fight him once the whole Continental Classic thing was over. Obviously, Andrade's not advancing. He don't got nothing to do. So they should fight at the World's End pay-per-view. Now, I saw this coming. However, there's really no story with this. It's literally been a one-sided beef with Miro, upset about his wife working with another man, Andrade probably don't even know who Miro is at this point because they've had zero interactions. So now you're going into the pay-per-view in a couple of days and it's just like, okay, we're going to see this fight, but like, why? You know, people want to see things. People want to see the story play out. And it's literally just been Miro being jealous on um, this past like two months or whatever and nothing else, nothing else. Tony Khan, can you give us a little bit more, please? So now we have Uncle Don. He is out with Don Callis' family. There are four paintings in the ring. They're all covered and he's gifting them um, to each member one by one in celebration for a boxing day or boxing week, whatever the situation is. I'm not Canadian. I don't know what this is about. Now we do have one painting that is going to be covered, which is actually for Simi Guevara. Now the paintings, they actually were all pretty ridiculous, but kind of nicely done but the craziest one was the one with Hobbs and Uncle Don. Uncle Don is looking like a white version of Tupac and he's giving a west side and shit and I'm just like what the fuck is this? This is hilarious. Now here is Sammy Guevara who's coming out. Sammy obviously had a baby recently with Tay Mello and um, that's all great and all. However this whole segment kind of felt a lot was going on and plus once again i felt like for the millionth time this year they tried to get sammy to be a baby face and i'm just like are we doing this again baby face like it's not working honestly when sammy made that decision to pretty much put his personal stuff out in the ring and pretty much show how much of a, a loser douchebag that he is in real life people really just have not liked him since um that situation but here we are and it's um you know all the members of don Callis family and basically don Callis has not reached out to cme in terms of you know him having the baby him being injured or anything like that don Callis said what what do you mean i actually sent a little gift for a little brat you just had did y'all get it yet or not and you know he's saying shit about how um, Sammy is not even ready to even be a parent, better yet, anything else in life that he ain't shit, he ain't smart, whatever the story is. And here comes Sammy attacking um, uh, Don Callis. Now, he was also upset about the painting. It was a painting of all the Don Callis family members, including Sammy holding his baby, and he was upset that the baby was in the painting. And I'm just like, wait a minute, I actually would not be upset if somebody painted my daughter in a painting. I think that would be kind of cute. 
Anyway, he gets upset, he attacks Don, and then I'm just like, bro, you did the wrong thing because all the other members are still in the ring. So now Takeshita Hobbs and, and Kyle Fletcher are gonna stomp him out with their good shoes. And here comes Chris Jericho for the for, for, for the Captain Savaho and saving uh Sammy Guevara. And I should have known that this was coming because obviously Kenny is injured. I mean, not injured. He's um, obviously just had surgery. He's not well. He's going to be out for a long time. And whatever other issues he got going on, Kenny, call me if you need a nurse. Um, he is not going to be there. So I'm now I'm just like, okay, so now what it looks like is that Sam is going to be Chris Jericho's partner. However, when that's going on, then here comes Pretty Ricky and... Big Bill, they come out to come help. And I'm just like, oh, okay, this is making sense. And then Sting and Darby comes out to come help them. And I'm just like, well, what the hell is going on here? So now they announce later on in the show that we're going to get an eight-man tag at the fucking pay-per-view. We have uh, Pretty Ricky. We have Big Bill, Hobbs, and take this, Kyle Fletcher, okay, versus... Um, Sting, Darby, Sammy Guevara, and Chris Jericho. Where, where the hell is Takeshita? Takeshita, who's a new alpha, is not doing anything. He beat Kenny Omega twice. Why are we not doing anything with Takeshita? He should have been in the Continental Classic. Something. This is what I keep saying. Like this is the booking is not consistent. You have a young guy like Takeshita who's super talented. I don't give a damn if he can't say good morning in English. He is one of the best guys on the wrestler and on the roster. And y'all not doing a damn thing with him after beating Kenny Omega twice. Lord have mercy. Jesus take the wheel. All right, so we have our last matches for the Blue League semifinals. Brian Danielson versus Eddie Kingston. And I'm telling you, the crowd was really going for Eddie here. Yeah, we had some people going for Brian or whatever. Um, but Eddie really seems to be the favorite here. Um, yeah, very shocked that Eddie Kingston won this. And to be honest, I wasn't even thinking that Eddie would even make it to the semifinals. Better yet, even making it to the finals. Um, I felt like this was, first of all, I thought this was going to be the fucking main event, and it wasn't. But we're going to get into that foolery in a minute. Um, this was a really, really great match. Brian Danielson was being annoying as fuck to Eddie Kingston. Just being antagonizing with those little kicks and, and little things to just really get... Um, Eddie Kingston getting riled up or whatnot. And I guess that ends up working out for Eddie because he ends up taking the win here. But I was really surprised to see that it was not going to be Moxley versus Brian in the end of this. And I'm looking at this and I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> you know, Brian, you, you, you broke your orbital bone. You have surgery and you came back a couple of weeks later to be in this whole tournament and didn't even fucking win it. If I'm going to be in a tournament and my face is cracked up, um, I better win this shit. You know what I mean? So, Brian, go home. Rest a little face before you go against Okada. And what? Whoa, like two weeks? Is that two weeks? Wow. Um, that's not enough time for you, but moving on. Um, really great match. After the match, um, John Moxley come and check on his bestie. And I'm not talking about Eddie. I'm talking about Brian. And then they have an exchange with each other, um, Moxley and Eddie. And he looks, Moxley looks at Eddie, he's like, you better give me 100%. And I'm just looking at Eddie Kingston and the way Eddie Kingston is looking, I'm like, bro, he's only have 15% left in him right now. You're lucky if you're gonna get 10 of it on the pay-per-view. These guys, you know, Moxley looks so much more fresh going against two people compared to Eddie Kingston just going against Brian Danielson. And that's just to say that Brian Danielson is just fucking flawless in the ring, by the way. Anyway, um, there was something that Eddie Kingston did mention that really um, felt contradicting to me was that Moxley had once told him to that when, when he wanted to quit, not to quit because um, he needed to be around um, to, to help build up these young cats in the back, you know, the young men back there. Um, and that was very contradicting to me because it was like, that's exactly what this tournament should have been for. These young guys who want to make it in this business, Swerve, um, Jay, 
um, even Jay Lethal too. I mean, he's probably not as young as the rest of them, but you know, these guys who have not yet gotten these opportunities in AEW, y'all could have really used it to catch the to catch us the alpha. This this guy haven't done a damn thing. And it's just like where these young guys are gonna fit in in a roster where big opportunities are going to these established stars. So when he said that, I was just like, man, that that hits on a different level because now you, you this kind of does not apply to any of these guys because an opportunity was potentially snatched away from some of these guys who were on this tournament, which is very unfortunate. But anyway, we're getting Moxley and we're getting um, Eddie Kingston in the finals. Um, and it just looks like at this point, from what I see, Eddie Kingston's gonna win. If anything, Eddie is gonna just keep all the titles that he had before and gain the AEW Continental Classic. And he's gonna have to defend all these titles at all these places which is kind of already what he's already been doing i'm not really interested now we do have our stepdaddy christian with mama wayne and nick wayne and they're with lexi and <laughs> christian is looking at lexi like who are you where, where's renee like renee got the night off like why are you here i don't know why that made me cackle but anyway they're waiting for adam and adam is taking his sweet time to get over there and it's okay you know i guess he's earned the right to take his time to go wherever the hell he wants to go up next we had the ladies in action and it was literally like 20 minutes before the show was going to be over when we had sky blue versus chris statlander and i don't really remember that he even announced this but whatever this match took i don't know like 12 minutes or so which was making me feel some type of way not because i don't care for the ladies but because i was like wait a minute we have enough time for something crazy to happen with the whole mass devil men and all that stuff so i was really really anxious to see that now we do have a decent match with these two girls however one thing that you know we were talking about um in the chat and everything during the live stream was that sky blue unfortunately is having to figure out her character all on tv no house shows no no other little shows off to the side where she can test things out and see what works and what doesn't work like with dark and elevation in them they don't have those options anymore so sky blue is really testing things out in my opinion i don't care for what she's doing but i, I also recognize that she really does not have a platform outside of live tv to really try to figure out what it is that she could be doing with her character um so something about it is falling flat for me but because of that reason i'm still like you know what she just needs time julia it took time for her to figure things out however julia did have dark and dark elevation to figure those things out and and she was working with house of black she has some advantages unfortunately um sky blue just don't have those type of advantages with her career right now she has a decent match ends up taking the win and i felt like she needed to take the win after what happened on collision she wins because julia comes out from under the ring and attack um chris statlander while uh sky blue is pretending like a fly hit her eye or something like that and aubrey's all looking to see if her eyes okay whatever it is what it is and they end up attacking uh chris statlander obviously willow comes out for the save for the millionth time this year i'm over it we keep saying the same things it was the same thing happening in ring of honor the same things keep happening on collision now here it is on dynamite they've done it a million times and it's getting old now chris, Stat chris statlander and willow are in the ring uh sky blue and julia ends up walking up the ramp and here comes abaddon abaddon is staring these girls down and then we have um julia and sky they end up walking a different way because they don't want to meet up with um abaddon and i understand however i really wish that julia would have been fearless in this moment because she's supposed to be like the spooky girl or whatever and she just looks spooked to me before we move on to the fuckery uh, that went on at the end of the show, we do have Soraya and Renee and Ruby Soho. Ruby has a match with Marina Shafir on Rampage. And just when she was just about to talk about that match, here comes Soraya saying that she has a gift for her. And her gift is Harley. Harley is the, 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 the girl that was with QTV. I can't remember her full name. She is there and she's like, this is your little helper. She's good with her hands or whatever. And then here is 
uh, Angela Parker calling Ruby and Ruby has no time for this. She has graduated from being a lesbian to get in dicks, whatever the situation is, and she goes on and take her call. Now, Soraya doesn't seem to be happy about this, and I'm feeling like Soraya is acting like maybe she's okay with um, the whole little romance between Ruby and um, Angela Parker, when really, she's probably gonna sabotage that whole relationship. Now, for the millionth time before this match, it is literally um, 950 something, okay? And they're showing the card for all in. I mean, not all in. They're showing the card for World's End for the millionth time that night. And I was like, how many times y'all gonna have to show it? Show the damn thing with MJF and, and Samoa Joe already. That thing didn't start until 9.58. And I'm just like, now I know that I should have never been excited about this to begin with because something stupid is going to happen. Now, oh, anyway, the mass men... They come out first, okay? They come out through the crowd and they get into the ring and then our scumbag comes out. He's looking great. And then Samoa Joe music hits. Where's Samoa Joe? Samoa Joe, can we cue Samoa Joe? Samoa Joe, are you still in the house? Samoa Joe is laid up back there holding on to his leg like Peter Griffin. Ow, ow, ow. And I'm just like, what the fuck? They attacked you now? And I was like, you know what? We're going to call off that match again. But then here is MJF saying, nah, fuck it. I'm going against these two. It's not like I've never had a handicap match before. He goes against those two guys, whoever they are. Now, for all the internet FBI's who were watching this, do you guys know who it was that was like, I don't know, one of those guys? I have no clue. Could not tell who it was based off the moves they were doing, based off their silhouette with the all black or whatever. I could not tell. Um, MJF seemed to have had the upper hand with these guys at times, but then someone else come out from the ring. Another masked person comes out with a lead pipe and hits, um, our scumbag right in the shoulder that he had all banged up, taped up, sewn up and everything. I mean, MJF, he's just being barely held on by threat at this point. So he, uh, that masked man hits the shoulder and then from there, whoever it was hit the heat seeker on MJF for the win, we have new tag titles. Um, onto, we have the tag titles onto new champions. And I was like, you know what? I'm okay with it. I don't know who the fuck y'all are, but y'all better be on Ring of Honor next week because I know tomorrow's episode is taped. Now we got new champions. It is what it is. And by then, by then, um, here is Samoa Joe going to help MJF. Titles are already lost. So at this point, it didn't even matter. He comes in there and then lights go out and then we see the mass devil on the screen. And then it said on the screen, um, what, what is that pleasure doing business with you? Something like that. And then Samoa Joe is just standing there behind MJF with a chair in his hand and he hits him with it. And it was just like, okay, um, are you the, the devil? Are you one of the dudes? He's not one of the dudes. Now, we've seen the attack from these dudes before. Ain't none of them built like Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe probably friends with them or whatever. I don't know. But I don't think he's even the one in the devil mask either. Because we've seen at least a silhouette of the person in the devil's mask. And it ain't no Samoa Joe. So, there's some kind of alliance there or whatever. And I'm going to be honest. The way I'm saying it actually kind of sounds better than how it happened. It was pure shit. The audience did not even give a damn about this. Nobody was really reacting to it. And it was just like, what is this? Something y'all just came up with two minutes before y'all came out? I just did not like it. People have been waiting on this storyline for quite some time. It's been a couple of months since we've had this. And then here we are. At this moment, y'all don't have to add up to mask that person, but they didn't look good at all. And to me, I just did not understand what the hell was going on. It, it just felt like some last minute shit. And this is the reason why Tony Khan is getting flamed up on, on social media right now, because it just seemed like you have people who care about your product and y'all not really sitting there thinking about what's the very best thing we can give them in terms of entertainment. And then you give fuckery like this, where it's just like, wow, I just wasted two hours being excited about something that actually was not good. And right before a pay-per-view too, what's gonna happen here? I have no clue, but I did not like the way that they, they handled the situation. People have been waiting for a long time for 
something to happen when it comes to the storyline and it just seemed like we got a lot of bullshit when really so much creativity could come out of this there's fans at home who can sit there and book this thing and make it so so good while we have Tony Khan who's sitting there and just like let me just I'm just gonna do the very first thing I think of I'm not gonna give it any other thought and unfortunately it really felt like you just thought of the very first thing and just did it and thought that that was great and it was not um i did forget to mention about the brawl between between um christian and um adam copeland it was like an on-site thing where it was just like oh i see you let's brawl they're brawling with each other security guards come into the ring no interview these people don't want to talk they want to fight now here the security guards are useless they can't do anything and then um adam and christian end up taking the fight into the hallway they literally have the entire ring of honor locker room keeping these guys away from each other well barely keeping these guys away from each other we even had the bond erics were there okay brian keith was there everybody was there being useless keeping adam and christian away from each other it's actually pretty pretty funny a lot of these clips are already on youtube all i'm gonna say is i actually am looking forward to seeing christian and Adam at it again. That I'm cool with. I knew this would happen. It's cool. Everything else, I just don't know. Oh, Abaddon and Julia, I'm cool with. Everything else, Lord have mercy. Tony Khan has to do better. 2024, new year. Let's come up with new approaches to things and, and new ways to do things. Tony Khan, you can't be the only person back there with these ideas all on your own. You're gonna have to help have to have people who can also contribute to telling stories, um, you know, from the back and having these things come to life on screen with that roster of yours is really unfortunate. A lot of things here was just a fucking miss rather than a hit. And I, I'm, I'm not too excited about World's End on Saturday. But guys, thanks so much for listening to, you, to, to me, you know, talk shit or whatever. I love pro wrestling, I really do. Tony Khan, get it together or just give me a call and I'll help you get it together. Guys, thanks for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with Ring of Honor. Bye.